Scripture reading this morning is from Deuteronomy 27. Then Moses and the elders of Israel charged the people, saying, Keep all the commandments which I command you today. So it shall be on the day when you shall cross the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God gives you, that you shall set up for yourselves large stones and coat them with lime. Down to verse 10 to 15. You shall therefore obey the Lord your God and do his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. Moses also charged the people on that day, saying, When you cross the Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And for the curse, these shall stand on Mount Ebal, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. The Levites shall then answer and say to all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed is the man who makes an idol or a molten image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Have you ever felt that you were taken for granted? How does it make you or leave you feeling? Unwanted, frustrated, disrespected, worthless? I think many people at times feel like they are being taken for granted. I think that's a feeling that probably all of us have at one time or the other. Uh, parents can think their kids take them for granted, and they often do. Uh, there's just things that, that we do, and uh, I think we need to think about that deeply sometimes. I ran across some statements about being taken for granted that I liked. One of them was this. It says, when you're always there for people, they stop appreciating you because your favors are now an expectation. Another one, even though even the most caring people get tired of being taken for granted. Give you a couple more. This one's from, uh, from Mother Teresa. Being unwanted, unloved, uncared for, forgotten by everyone, I think is a much greater hunger and much greater poverty than the person who has nothing to eat. And one last one says so staying with someone or a group who doesn't appreciate you isn't loyalty, it's stupidity. In other words, if everybody takes you for granted, it's not smart <laughs> to stay and continue to go through that. When I stop and think about it, I bet all of us have people we have taken for granted also. As I said earlier, children often take their parents for granted. Too often husbands and wives take their spouses for granted. We all need to learn to express our appreciation to those around us for what they mean in our lives. But I think the greatest example of someone being taken for granted is Old Testament Israel and how they treated God. And that's what our scripture reading this morning was all about. Israel is coming into the promised land. And God tells them, if you obey me and keep my commandments, you're going to be blessed in the land. But he said, if you don't, if you're going to take me for granted and not keep my commandments, he gave him a whole list of curses that would come on them and upon the land. And Yahweh was true to his word. Israel would be obedient and they would be blessed. Think about Israel, what came of them. Uh, well, let's go back earlier. This is the story of the judges, by the way. They would follow God for a while and God would bless them. And then they would decide, well, 
you know, maybe there's other gods. Maybe there's other things that are more important. And what would happen? Bang! Down they'd go. Other nations would take them over. They'd steal their crops. They, they would just abuse them. So Israel would fall at their feet and say, God, we're sorry. Give us another chance. So God would start blessing them again. And they would follow his commandments again. And then you know what happened? Once they started prospering, it was right back down the hill. It was a roller coaster for Israel. That's what the whole Old Testament is about. They reached their pinnacle of being blessed under King David. They were one of the greatest nations under King David that was on the planet at that point in their history. And what happened? Solomon came in. He was influenced by his many wives and concubines. They built tabernacles or temples not only to uh, Yahweh, but they built them to the gods of his, of his wives' lands. And eventually, they lost their country totally. Rome ended up having it by the time of Christ. But all this happened because they got in this cycle of taking God for granted, taking his blessings for granted, as though it was not something he was blessing them, though it was their right to have. Stuart, Stuart Briscoe, famous pastor of this present day even, wrote a book about minor prophets, and he entitled it, Taking God Seriously. He said, that's what the minor prophets are all about and preaching about. People need to learn to get serious about listening to what God says in his word and following what God says. You know, it's not that Israel ever completely walked away from God and said, God, we want nothing to do with you. They always believed in Yahweh. They always believed that they were the chosen people. They just took it for granted and refused to get serious about obeying God. As we come uh, continue on this morning to talk about developing a deeper relationship with God, one of the places we need to stop is we need to stop and ask ourselves, do I ever take God for granted? Do I willingly accept the grand things that he's done for all of us? And we are blessed even though we don't, we don't appreciate it sometimes. And the problem is, if we take God for Yahweh, do you think you can ever have a personal relationship with him? You know, taking people from granted will hurt your relationship more than anything else. Because they get to the point you do where you think, well, they don't really love me. They don't really care about me. You know, it's that way. God wants to constantly dwell with you through his Holy Spirit. He wants to walk with you every aspect of your life, but he will not force himself on anyone. If our lives are full of the cares of this life, we don't have room for Yahuwah, and Yahuwah isn't going to be there for us because God always is separated from sin. That's why he could no longer fellowship with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Last week we discussed that God was infinite, that he had no imperfections, and thus his ways are way above our ways. Uh, you know, sometimes we don't understand his ways are better than our ways, and oftentimes, uh, and oftentimes we just separate ourselves from God. We disagree, basically, with the universe, creator of the universe and how it works. And we think we know better as to how things should work. We all do so discuss that he is unchangeable, that he can't be better because he's already perfect, and he can't get worse because then he would uh, cease to be perfect. But the fact is, he is unchangeable gives us something that we can rest on, something that is stable for our lives, something that will never go away. In the depths of sorrow or in the, in the high areas of, of joy, we can understand that he's going to be there and he wants to be a part of our life. 
We also discuss that God is love. It's part of his nature. And when we accept this simple fact, we learn that we can accept the discipline that comes because of his love when we begin to fail him. When we begin to understand all that God is, at least as much as we can comprehend of all God is, then we begin to build a relationship that centers around his nature and his spirit dwelling in our lives. And we begin to understand who God is and we begin to comprehend his greatness compared to us. Uh, and if we begin to understand how great God is compared to us, there is, there is no way we would ever take him for granted. Some of the other things we learn when we study about God is God is eternal. Now, what does this mean to us? Well, when you can figure that out, let me know. Because I can't comprehend what that means. I can't comprehend that way back there in the past, before the world was even thought of, God existed. And... We, we live with him now, hopefully, day by day. And he's told us what's going to happen out there in the future. But can you comprehend never dying, living forever, and what that would mean? In fellowship, especially with God, the creator of it all? I think when we stop to think about it and contemplate it, it's a shock to our systems. How can that be? But it is. That's simply it. We can study history all we want, but it doesn't go back to God's beginning. And so we can't understand that because he had no beginning. We can get an idea of what the future is going to bring, uh, but being creatures of, of that die, we have a little difficulty or understanding the idea of being immortal. In the 90th Psalm, Moses makes an interesting comparison. By the way, this is thought to be the oldest psalm that we have, written by Moses. He says in verses, the first three verses, he said, it says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. From before the mountains were born, or thou didst give birth to the earth and to the world. Even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou dost turn man back into dust. And dost say, return, O children of men. It's pointed out that God has been there from before the world was created. And in comparison to that, and... Later on, it's going to tell you in verse 10 that our lives are limited to about 70 years or 80 if we're strong, don't get sick. He says, God's existed from way out there beyond when you can see or comprehend to way out there on the other direction, which you can't comprehend. That's God exists all that way. He says, he gives you 70 years, and he says, go back to the dust. You know, some people, we don't know the background of this psalm. Some think it was based on the people that were dying in the wilderness. He saw all the people that had sinned died. Those 40, that, those 40 and over all died in the wilderness. Millions of people probably died coming and making the trip for those 40 years in the wilderness. And he sees all this and he realizes how limited we are compared to God. And he says we're limited because of God's fury or wrath against people for their sin. You know, we're told of the time in the Bible when people lived uh, 900 years before they died. Can you comprehend that? I think somebody that makes it to 100 is ancient, and they are in our, in our way of thinking. But think about people that lived for 900 years, and yet 
900 years is not a drop in the bucket to what we can live if we comprehend God and what he wants from us. We desperately need Yahuwah when we think about it. If we want more than the miserable lives that we live today in anticipation of death. And can you stop and think in your own minds what it would be like for your best, closest personal friend to be the one that has existed from eternity and will continue to exist into eternity. And the fact that he wants to be your friend, your best friend. We need that personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. He ends, by the way, by asking God's favor to be upon us. Israel fell in the wilderness because of their taking God for granted, because they had a lack of faith and trust in him. Now remember, God hasn't changed from before time began. He hasn't changed out into time forever into the future. He never changes and we still need the same thing that they need to have. We need to have faith and trust in Him, and we need to live lives of obedience unto Him. Because God is immortal, has immortality, we should celebrate the availability He has and that we have of walking for Him every day and for the hope He brings to us. Paul, in writing to Timothy, says this in Timothy 1, 6, chapter 6, verses 10 through 16. I want to read the whole thing because I, I just think it's so good. He starts out and he says, For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some longing for it have wandered away from faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, Love, perseverance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And that you make good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you therefore in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified of the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about in the proper time. He who is the blessed and the only sovereign King of kings, the Lord of hosts, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in an unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be glory and honor uh, and eternal dom dom domination, dom dominion. Ah, turn it around, try it the other way. Amen. What is pointed out is all the things that we need to do in pursuing righteousness and godliness and faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. And the reason for that is, is because God is the one that gives life to everything. The life that we now have has been given to us for God as a, or by God as a gift. And it points out that this is because we understand that God is the only one that has had immortality from the beginning to the end uh, because there is no beginning and end with him. Uh, Jesus Christ has immortality now because he was resurrected that way. And we have that hope also if we don't take God for granted and make sure he's the, the center post around which our life revolves. Something else that we learn when we start studying about God, he's omniscient. Now, what does that mean? Me mean know and see everything. Go back to before time ever was. He knew everything. He knows everything that's going to happen in your life. Now we have our free will to respond to what the things that happen in our life, but he also can probably see and know what we're, how we're going to respond. 
The Bible says he knows every hair on your head. And he knows this throughout eternity. From the beginning to the end, he knows everything. Every blade of grass that has grown, he knows. It's omniscience. David gives us a good understanding, I think, of this in Psalms 139, 1 through 6. In fact, if you study Psalms 139, the omni things about God, God is omniscient, he's omnipotent, and he's, what's the other one? Omnipresent. He is the, the, all those omni things are talked about in Psalms 139. But the first six verses talks about his omniscience. David says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thoughts from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down. And thou art intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain unto it. Now what is David saying? What is he sharing with us? Did David say, Lord, I come to church every Sunday and I come to worship you, but please let me have the rest of my time without bothering me. Uh, please don't try to look inside and comprehend what I'm thinking right now because it might not please you. Uh, and so don't do that, okay? Is that it? No, he, David looks at God and he comprehends him as much as he can and he says, God knows me better than I know myself. We can't hide anything from God. He understands our thoughts all the time. He knows what's in our hearts before we speak it to him. He knows what our desires are before we speak it to him. And David praises him for something he himself can't even understand. Can you understand a God that knows you that well? I have trouble comprehending it. The question is, does that scare us to death? Or does it fill us with wonder and, and glory that, that God has taken enough time to know us that well? Later on, the psalmist says, 147.5, 147.5, Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. There is no limit whatsoever on God's understanding. He has all the knowledge, past, present, and future. There's nothing he doesn't understand, and you can't hide a thing from him. So there's no sense in trying. Now, what does that mean in our lives? Forget what some people talk about the brilliant mind of Stephen Hawkins. Stephen Hawkins doesn't know anything compared to God. You can take the best scientist you have. You can take a room full of scientists or a, or a whole stadium full of scientists, the most brilliant you have out there, and you know what there it is? Their knowledge is like a little drop of sand on the seashore compared to God's. Forget what the Supreme Court says when it sanctions abortions or same-sex marriage. God defined marriage as one man and one woman. And that's what it means. And God knows what is best for us because of his knowledge. Knowledge begins with God, the Bible tells us, with the fear of God. And it's more useful. There is more useful information in this book right now, I can tell you, than there is in all the library books in the rest of the world. 
There is more information here because this is God, the creator of the universe, the one that knows everything, and that is his handbook. This is his handbook to teach us how to live our lives in such ways that will be best for us and will make us the happiest when it all comes down to the end. It means that because God is all-knowing, when God gives us directions, we know he's already considered all the variables. And I can guarantee you he does it faster than any computer you've ever heard of. He's already considered all the variables, and the direction he gives us is always going to be right. You know, I've had people talk about that when you have a big decision to make, you should ask God to give you the different alternatives so we can choose the one that seems best to us. That's stupid. When we have a decision that needs to be made as to what direction we need to go, we need to pray that God will show us His way because that's going to be the best way because He owes everything. He knows what the results will be if you take any other direction. He knows what is best for us. If you ask Yahweh for answers, God will give you the right one the very first time. But how often do we ask God for an answer? And when we don't like the answer that he gives us, we go back to him for another alternative and say, uh, we don't really like what's going on here. Let's try this again. God is never going to give you the wrong way. Maybe from your wisdom, but not from what God knows and understands. We also need to make sure that the answer that He we think he gives us corresponds to the scripture. Because if it goes against something that is said in God's word, it's not from God. It's from some other place. It's that simple. It never runs contrary to his revealed word. When God gives us a direction, or when we ask for direction for God, the best thing we can do is be quiet a little bit, not push him, and wait for the answer. And when it comes, we're going to be positive that that's what it is. And he's also going to give us the right answer because he loves us. And he wants what is best in our lives. I think this idea that God is omniscient is just almost mind-blowing. That he, The amount of knowledge that he knows. Computers throughout all the universe have plugged together, did not have a uh, little bit of, or the just an iota of God's knowledge of us. And we're also told He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. There's nothing God cannot do if that is His will. Isn't that the message that the angel brought from God to Mary in Luke 1 37? It says, For nothing will be impossible with God. There's nothing he can't do. That was the message given to Sarah when she laughed, when she was beyond childbearing years. And she laughed. And what did the angel say to Moses in Genesis uh, 18, 14? He says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Impossible by the human mind, by the human body, but with God, nothing is impossible. And the mind blowing thing about this guy, this individual, this God that we have, is he wants to have a personal relationship with us. To me, that is just amazing. It is that same power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us, that directs us in through, and into and through that relationship. 
You know the only hindrance to God's Spirit working in our lives? The hindrances are number one, sin. Second is our desire to live life on our terms instead of God's. It's scary to think you're going to willing, be willing to turn your life over and totally to God and let Him direct it. Because it may not go the direction we want it to go. But He knows a lot more than we do. And lastly, it's simply refusing to understand and accept God's will in our lives. The simple fact that He is omnipotent means that He can enable us to accomplish His will when He shows His will to us. For brevity's sake, let me condense what God says in Isaiah 46, 10 and 11. You can read the whole thing if you want. It says, My purpose will be to... My purpose will, God is speaking, he says, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it and surely I will do it. You know, if God ever asks you to do something, he will enable you to do it. Think about Noah. God told him to big this gigantic boat. And most of us would have responded with, why? It's never rained. Why should I build a boat? But he built a boat, and it rained. He didn't think he could probably do it, but it happened. God enabled Gideon and 300 men to defeat an army of 120,000 people. God's power can accomplish anything. Jesus and his disciples healed people who were sick of deadly diseases. When you start thinking about Bible, you can come up with just example after example of God's power being illustrated to people through his servants. And I want you to think of something else. His power isn't any different today than it was then. It has never diminished a bit. Now the way he's using it might diminish a little bit or be different, not diminished, be different than it was then. In other words, I don't think he gives any individuals, the personal individuals, the right to heal somebody else. But he gives us the ability to pray for their healing, that his will might be done in that. But we need to understand that same power that has been available from the beginning is available in the church much more so than it was in ancient Israel. In ancient Israel, the giving of God's power was kind of sporadic, given to specific prophets to carry specific messages. But in the New Testament, we're told for the church, the Holy Spirit comes and fills us when we accept His Son in the waters of baptism. And when your life is centered on your daily relationship with God, He will begin to rearrange your thinking. It's exactly what Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Let God rearrange your thinking to match His. That's what He wants in our lives, that you may prove that will of God, what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I think the problem is a lot of people today don't want their minds to be renewed by God. Truth be told, many people would prefer a God who stays out of our daily lives and just meets with us on Sundays. They don't want God looking over their ever activities any more than they want their pastor to look over their shoulders and see what they're doing in their daily lives day by day. 
I wonder how many children here today would like it if I was ever in their home when they were yelling at their parents, screaming at their parents, and knowing how that would make me feel about them. But you know what? God never leaves us. He's always there. And when you yell and scream at your parents, guess who knows it? And guess who doesn't like it? And let me tell you, you don't want to have the God of this universe mad at you. It's bad enough to have a parent upset with you, but you don't want to get God angry with you. And we as parents, we have people that are over us in authority too. There isn't a one of us that shouldn't have at least God over us as an authority figure. And we are to obey him. But a lot of people don't want that to happen. But when you are convinced that God loves you and is changing your mind, God may show you things you don't want to know. He may convict you that he wants you to accomplish something that you believe is beyond your power or resources. And when you're willing to go out on faith and try to do that, then, then you will know the joy of, of serving God the way you should. God wants us to accomplish things. And if we open our hearts and our minds, he's going to let us know what it is he wants us to do. Now, as I said before, it always has to correspond with this so we know it's right. But if he tells us to go out and do something and he wants us to do it, He's going to give us the power and the resources to do it. And the thing that you shouldn't do is to go somebody else and say, well, God has told me that we should do this. So you do this. Because God has shown me. When God convinces us that our, it is our job or his will that we do this, us, individually, then we better make sure that we do it. And we should follow that to the end. God has different plans for every one of us. Every one of us is different. He's given us different gifts and different abilities. But these plans will never go against the scriptures. And God wants us to be fulfilled. He wants us to be happy as much as we can be in a difficult world around us. We have a God that's beyond our understanding. He knows everything from before time was through what time will be throughout eternity. It's really beyond our comprehension to understand this. With all he knows, you know what he really wants? What God wants is a personal relationship with you. When you have... When you're up in the middle of the night and have things running through your minds that are bothering you, he wants you to share them with him. He already knows they're there. And he wants to help you work through those things. When you have anxiety in your life, God wants to be there standing next to you, helping you work it out. God wants to be actively involved in our lives each and every day. He wants to enter and dwell in our lives through His Holy Spirit. And He wants to make each one of us the best person we can possibly be. The best servant we can also, that we can possibly be. He wants to bring us peace and hope to calm lives in a turbulent world. And He wants us to serve Him. And He's willing to give us the power and the means to accomplish whatever He sets before us.